Nah. Splish. Wait. several ways to give here you're going to see a link pop up you'll see some instructions on how you can give so while you're waiting prep your heart and we're getting ready for an incredible word in just a few minutes Tonight is a night of house switching. From the house of fear by which we have no spirit given to the house of God by which we have his spirit given. I declare a house switch that we're no longer into bondage to fear, but as sons and daughters of God, we cry out, Abba, Father. I declare the spirit of adoption in this place in Jesus' name. I declare generational name shifting in Jesus' name. I declare right now that we are leaving Jacob on the mountain and walking off with Israel on our calling and in our promise in Jesus' name. Somebody yell freedom. In Jesus' mighty name. Somebody shout amen.
Sometimes you got to pray to the atmosphere break. Did y'all feel that? Sometimes you got to pray to the atmosphere break. See, I don't understand this modern day Christian. You know, I think that as we adapted to the modern day Christian, maybe we walked away from the set example as members of the way. That's what the early church called themselves. They said, we are the way because he said, I am the way. The moment we cease to be the way, then we really lay down our responsibility to show the way or be an example. We've settled in this modern day Christianity that doesn't understand wrestling and prayer until God blesses you, even if he's got to hurt you to bless you. We don't understand enduring a thing. We want that instant, I said it, hand it to me type of prayer. We, we don't understand that sit there and wait until you be filled with, uh, with power from on high. We want that come on prophet lay your hands on me and impart the gift right away type of thing. But we don't want to sit and wait. We don't want to wait on the Lord. We don't, we don't like that part. But something happens when you wrestle with God and it is never that God changes some of us don't like to wrestle with the Lord we like the Floyd Mayweather the Lord switch weight classes so we ain't gotta fight the battle <laughs> and then still call ourselves champions I'm just playing Floyd. <laughs> if you have your Bible, we're going to be uh, reading some verses we've been reading for the last couple of weeks. Uh, I think uh, this is how we started this. I'm going to go Exodus chapter 20, verse 1 and 2, and then I'm going to go to Galatians 4, and then I'm going to go to Romans 8. It says this in uh, Exodus chapter 20. It says, And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. And he goes on to give the Ten Commandments. I just want to point out that God has brought us out of the house of bondage. It's amazing that God categorizes the house of bondage, but you have so many who heard these words and desired to go back for a salad leeks and onions I don't mind slavery if it feeds me well that's what they were saying I don't mind bondage if it pays me well Galatians 4 chapter 1 through 6 says now I say that the heir as long as he is a child does not differ at all from a slave though he is master of all but is under guardians and stewards until the appointed time by the father even so we when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that he might receive the adoption as sons, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying out, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. In Romans 8, chapter, Romans chapter 8, verse 12 through 17 says, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors. Uh, that said, yo, we broken owe a lot. <laughs> hey, we owe a lot. We are in debt, but not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. We don't owe the flesh anything. The flesh has been paid. We don't owe the flesh nothing. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear. 
but you receive the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Amen. You may be seated. You know, this right here, man, is, um, this is, this is the last part of this message. You know, I've been preaching this message for four messages. One sermon turned into four sermons, and not four candy-coated, cheap little sermons, but four sermons that ran about an hour 45 each, because y'all don't let a dude go home. <laughs> hour 45 of all but no shape. <laughs> Hour 45. So today we're going to finish up. This is the one that we, we started this message, uh, I don't know, three, four weeks ago. We dealt with spirit of witchcraft, divination, right? Then we dealt with familiar spirits in that. And uh, that turned into two different messages. The familiar spirits was a midweek. And then on Sunday we did the in the beginning or the beginning message. I remember that. Yeah. And now here, here's this one. This was all part of, this was all one message. I don't know why I thought I'd be able to get this all out on one Wednesday when I came out originally. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 so this here, uh, we're, dealing, we're dealing with bondage. And God is very specific about bondage and about our household and about what makes us slaves and about what makes us sons and how there's this whole exchange that goes on. The reality of it is a lot of the exchange that goes on um, either happens over our head because we're unaware, right, or happens in our heart because we yield to it. And so, so we have options to be free or to be bound. Period. We have the option. It's our option. Let me say that again. It's your option to be free or to be bound. There is nobody that is bound because, because they have to be bound. There is nobody that is bound because they are owned by something else that, that has placed them there and they cannot be free because it's the law. Nobody. That's, that's physical, in the physical realm here, at least here. I mean, there is still human slavery in the world. Um, but that's also spiritual. If you are bound, it's because you want to be. Because it's easy to switch houses. Uh, I love the way, I love the way that, that is said right here in Romans 8. Paul says it about God. Here, here's the thing. Well, you, you could say, well, how is, that, uh, how is that true? The devil made me do this. The devil didn't make you do nothing. Let me tell you who, 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 why you can't be stopped. It's, it's, it says here that the spirit himself bears witness. Like, like who, who is it? If you go down this, this, this whole uh, uh, chapter, it goes, into, it goes into who is it who could bring a charge against the elect? Because the spirit himself bears witness. Who is a witness over God's witness? What story have you heard over God's story that tells you that freedom is not for you? And it can, go from, it can go from what you look like to, to, to sex to race. I mean, the woman at the well said, uh, what do you have to do with me? You're a Jew. I'm a Sumerian. She, she, she started dealing with all of her inner politics. Or it can go right to the church because the church is the place that gets a lot of people bound up the most. We teach a lot of rules and a lot of doctrine made off of a lot of opinion or a lot of interpretation. And then we teach very milky, soft, candy, cotton words that don't bring anyone freedom. The reality of it is, if you're going to know the truth because you keep his word, and that truth makes you free, so long as I don't teach you the truth or his word, I don't teach you freedom. And I just become a worker in the slave trade. Yeah, I said it. And, and you just become a worker in the slave trade. And so, so what happens is the spirit bears witness um, with us. I love how that woman said uh, about, about worship. She said, she said to Jesus, do we worship on this mountain or this mountain? Her bondage, her bondage came from her worship experience. Uh, so let's deal with the house of bondage. Because he said, I'm the one who brought you up out of the house of bondage. So I'm going to start like this. Come up out. Look at your neighbor and say, come up out. Look at your other neighbor and say, come up off of me with all of that nonsense. 
You're, you're too close and your breath stink. <laughs> so <laughs> let, me just, let me just point out here that bondage, bondage there's, there is spiritual bondage that we're dealing with. Bondage is not, um, it's not, not uh, something you can see these days with chains or handcuffs. It happens in the spirit. That there is a spirit that wants to put you into bondage. Right? I mean, or the Bible wouldn't say it. So if there's a spirit whose sole purpose and function is to put you into bondage, how do we prepare for it? How do we even know to look for it? How do we know what we're looking for in a society that tells us this is, this is just your frame of thinking or your frame of mind or a result of your actions or this and that? Now, first, let me say there are a lot of things that are a result of your actions. Stupid is as stupid does, said the prophet Forrest Gump. But, but the reality of it is um, at the end of the day, there is also a spirit that works with your ignorance and works with you to try to bring you into this bondage. The way that James said it is it's by a man's own lust that he's dragged away and enticed. And at the, the end game of the enticing and the dragging away because, because this happens, he has the desire, he's lusting, and then he's dragged away and then he's enticed to stay. What happens in that dragging away and the being enticed to stay is an intimate relationship and then a pregnancy and then a birthing and then a growing up and a murdering. This is what the scripture says. It says, it says that, that when you conceive sin, Right? Then you eventually give birth to it. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. It's incestuous. It's, it's demonic incest because the, the, the sin gave, uh, something gave birth to sin, and then that sin grew up and had a relationship with you, and then y'all had a child, which was death. It's inbreeding of, 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 of demonizing. It's inbreeding of oppression. It, it, this, is, this is not something new. This is a child you birthed that you became intimate with that killed you. James was Jesus' brother, so his words is strong. Here's, I'm going to do it in a minute. Uh, one, one weapon of bondage that we see, right? Actually, it's three. I'm going to give y'all three weapons. I'm going to give y'all a couple. I'm just gonna, I ain't going to tell you how many I'm going to give you. I'm just going to give it. How many of y'all want it? All right. Got to give y'all their weapons because Pastor Paul talked on some of our weapons last week, and, um, and this is what we need that weapon for. One, 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 one of the weapons is deception. One of the weapons is ignorance. One of the weapons is strongholds. All of these belong to you. I don't know where I'm going to walk through it. I'm going to walk through it. Deception. Deception. Deception is, is, is different than lying. Y'all know that, right? Being deceived is different than being a liar. When someone lies to you, they have malintent, or when you lie, you have malintent to cover up the truth. You are intentionally trying to cover the truth with something that's not true. To get out of something or gain a benefit, that's, that's a lie, right? Deception is different. This being deceived is when you actually believe the thing you're saying, but it's just wrong. You believe it to be true. So you're not lying. You have no intention when you're saying something to somebody because you think what you're saying is actually true. You believe your own story. You drink your own Kool-Aid. That's what deception is. Deception has two categories. Deception has two categories. One is that you could be deceived by others. Other people deceive you, tell you something, you believe it to be true, and you walk into what they say. And then, and then there is self-deception. So it, those categories kind of break down like this. Um, self-deception um, is when you are, 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 excuse me, someone deceives you is when they get you looking at something for long enough to change your opinion about it. Check out these YouTube links. You, you, spend, you spend hours chasing, chasing uh, all this Illuminati fodder. Now, I ain't got no problems if you be like with the Illuminati and all that stuff, right? Who in the Illuminati? Raise your hand. <laughs> you know how to catch how to recruit me into the Illuminati in the YouTube comments? I said, man, you're not in the Illuminati. <laughs> These guys, what are they doing, man? Anyway, <laughs> this is what they come to? They come down to the comments? Anyway, um, 
<laughs> but, but I ain't saying nothing about that or not, but here's the thing. There could be lots of truth and historical facts in a lot of the things you're watching, but when you begin to chase them more than you chase God, you have then yielded to them. And you spend hours on YouTube watching videos about the Rothschilds, and you spend no time in your scripture learning about God's child, then we have a problem with our heart because Jesus himself said, don't glory in that. Rather glory in this. So, so there's a separation, but we can become deceived by that. We can become deceived by some other idea that somebody planted in us or some religious idea that somebody told us. The Bible says that, that Eve stared at that fruit. You know, the, the, the serpent barely said anything to her. Oh, he ain't really got to, he ain't got to have your ear long if, as long as he can get you staring at what he wants you looking at. A picture's worth a thousand words, they say. So if I can get you looking at it long enough, eventually you'll convince yourself that it's good. And she stared at that, that fruit. The Bible says she saw that it was good for food. And then she saw that it was good for making men wise. And then she saw, like all of this stuff, she just, she, he, didn't, he didn't even sell it to her no more. She just looking, 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 looking until, until she was deceived by it. Because um, if you stare at something long enough through the wrong filter, it will change you. Everything always has a spiritual filter, period. There is nothing that you look at that does not have a spiritual filter. I know that's hard to take. And that's because some of y'all don't, y'all, y'all, y'all don't realize that when you don't activate Christ as the filter that you look at something through, that just because you have decided to take that filter off, you don't realize that you have unknowingly put another filter on. We like to think I'm my own person all the time. But no, if the enemy is called the, 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 the prince of the powers of the air, then, then there is illusionary tactics of the enemy to skew what you see. So, so uh, the question then is if there's always a spiritual filter, are we always looking through Christ? Are we? Do I look at everything like I'm looking through Christ? How would, G- how would Jesus respond to this comment? Jesus would tell them, shut up. Shut up. Bam. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> if y'all see me get fouled in the comments, it's because I thoroughly believe Jesus would say that same thing. I do, because I take time to think about what I put on my comments. So if I smart mouth somebody, I believe Jesus is fed up as well. <laughs> I could be an error, and he'll tell me when I die. <laughs> but in that moment, I was 100% sure this is how Jesus will respond. Um, but, but are we looking through Christ? I say that because David makes this, this, this comment in Psalms 123. He says, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Right? He looked at the valley of the shadow of death through a God filter. Because, because he's looking through a God filter, he says, I'll fear no evil because you are with me. So, so when I'm walking through this, as long as you're with me, I'm not scared. And your, your rod and your staff is comfortable when I look at it through the God filter. The rod is not comfortable on the back of the fool, scripturally. The Bible says that, that, that the rod is for the back of the fool, or the, the, a child's heart is filled with folly, but the rod of correction purges it far from him. The rod is not an issue of comfort. But when I look at that correction through God, where God disciplines those he loves, then, then that rod and that staff, it comforts me. When I, when I see my enemies, I don't really see them like, oh, here go the haters. I really see the table prepared before me when I look, for, when I look through God. When I, when I look through God, I can see the benefit, not just the criticism of it. There's, there's, there's something to having a Christ filter. When I look at the argument I have with my spouse or I look at the situation going on with my children or I look at my economics, a Christ filter changes everything. 39 cents in the account ain't too small when I got it on a Jesus filter. Now, if I don't put Jesus on it, it's a pack of ramen. Maybe two. That save a lot. Right, But if I put Jesus on that 39 cent, it's fish and loaves. 
it's, it's different. It's, 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 it's an opportunity to put a seed of all I had because the woman with the two mites gave more than those who gave in their abundance. And, and be not deceived that God is not mocked. That what a man sows, he also reaps, and God meets a need. When I look at stuff through a Jesus filter, if I'm not looking at it through the Christ filter, then I'm looking at it through the veil because everything has a spiritual filter. The enemy... Uh, the enemy has illusions that he wants us to stare through. So when I look at the news, I'm either going to look through a God filter or the news is filter. I'm going to look at what's going on in the world through a God filter or through a racist filter. I'm going to look at it through a God filter or through a political filter. Oh, yes, it's quiet in this Baptist church. Yeah, well, I'm coming down your street today. We're either going to look at it through a God filter are we going to be propag propagandized, hypnotized, right? We're going to be ventriloquized. I don't know if I made that up or not. It might be real, though. Ventriloquized. Just write it down. We'll look it up later. It's a Scrabble challenge. Somebody challenge my Scrabble word. But we'd have been adjusted to where details and facts no longer matter, to where compassion and lamentation no longer matter. So when it comes down to simple arguments of right or wrong, for red or blue, for black or white, where is Jesus in your filter? I was, I was online last night, and uh, yesterday evening, and something came up. It was an article of, of um, a shooting or something like that. Um, some other information regarding some of the stuff that's going on, and I could not share it. I was restrained from sharing it. I, and I looked at my wife and I said, I wanna share this. I said, but the climate right now. I said, I don't think that it will become helpful. I think it will become ammo. And if we just throw the, continue to throw gas on the fire, there's nothing being accomplished right now. So I had to change that and divide the tongue and put up something else. Because you got to put a filter on it. Somebody said put a filter on it. So that's, that's, that's the, 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 when you get deceived, right? That's being deceived by somebody else, but then there's self-deception, right? Self-deception is, is, is crazy because we, one, are the biggest fans of ourselves, so we don't ever think that we're getting it wrong or that we would lead ourselves astray. And so when we get into self-deception, it's, it's amazing how it works. You know disobedience leads to self-deception. Disobedience leads to self-deception. It, it, it's not one of those things that you're like, I'm going to go out here and live a lie. That's not because you think you're doing right. It's disobedience that leads to it. And it's disobedience usually in the small thing. The Bible says when you hear a word and you don't do it. It says it's like looking in the mirror, forgetting what you look like immediately. It said that this person, uh, their religion is in vain and they deceive themselves. Because the minute you hear what you're supposed to do and you do the opposite of what you're supposed to do, the only way you can keep that in, 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 in your head is you have to rationalize what's going on around you or in your head in order to be okay with that choice or stay the same. And the minute you do that, you start to feel justified in doing that. And so you get locked in and you say, so that's how you can go to church every Sunday. That's how you can go to church every Wednesday. That's how you can read your Bible on Thursdays in the small group, but go home and still not talk to your mother who you ain't talked to since three Christmases ago. And be okay with it. That's, that's, how, that's how you could justify coming home from church and your husband say, hey, let me get that. And you say, I got a headache. Tired, tired, been worshiping God too hard. Well, Sarah, Sarah submitted to Abraham as unto the Lord, so. <laughs> little, little silly things, though, of hearing a word and not doing it, that you rationalize it. And what, here's what I put. I put we create conditional commandments. At what point are we uh, have the authority to make God's word conditional? Uh, um, uh, God only expects this from me, you know, uh, in the right conditions. God only expects me to love my wife as Christ loved the church if my wife submits to me. God only expects me to submit to my husband as unto the Lord if he loves me like Christ loved the church. No, that's your condition. Bible says, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord, period. Next, uh, next, next sentence is, 
Husbands, love your wives like Christ loved the church, period. And gave himself up for her. And this and that. Me loving my wife has nothing to do with her submitting to me. And her submitting to me has nothing to do with me loving her right. It's, it's similar to the relationship between visitation and child support. They do not go together just because you think they do. Just because you think you can hold the kids hostage until you get a check. Uh, uh, that's not how the law works. Just, just so you think you cannot pay your child support because she don't let you get them when you want to. Because you don't want to keep no structure. That's, no, that's not how it works. That's your condition as not the law. That's how it works. We, we think I only got to forgive somebody if they apologize. No, 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 no. That's not what the scriptures say. That I only got to apologize to somebody if they apologize too. You know how many apologies go? You know how many apologies go wrong with this right here? Hey, listen, I just, I just really wanted to tell you that for, for my part and what's going on, um, I'm really sorry. I didn't have to talk to you like that. You know, I just felt a certain way, but I, I got out of hand. And then that person says, okay, thank you. And you'd be like, you, you don't have nothing you want to say right here? I said thank you. I forgive you. You know, you were wrong. Absolutely. I'm glad you recognized it. You know, hold on a minute. I only said that because... Your apology was conditional on apology. No, the Bible says if you got to out with a brother, go make it right. The Bible say go and forgive. The Bible say take the low road. It ain't conditional upon who you got to do it to. There's people sometimes you got to forgive that are already dead. Someone kills themselves that's close to you and you're angry with them. Somebody dies early and you're mad at them that they weren't there to raise you or they left you too early and left you in this world unprotected. And you get a bird, you get angry. You don't even realize in your heart you have bitterness to someone who can never make it right and really did not do you wrong. Sometimes we got bitterness in our heart for people we'll never even meet. Mad at celebrities, presidents. Mad at stories on Dateline. Just mad at folk. And then they leave. The, they leave. Ten years later, you forgot that that president was, four, was, was only in for four years. And all the curses you spoke over yourself and bound yourself to and bitterness, he gone, he gone and gone. And you say, it's still his fault. You know, it, this is just the uh, uh, policies from so-and-so. You can put any name there. Bush, Obama, Trump, Clinton. What's, what's your fancy of bitterness? Which, which unforgiveness do you prefer? I mean, choose your bondage accordingly. Match, match it with your shoestrings at least. Conditional commandments. Uh, so deception is one weapon of bondage. Ignorance is a weapon of bondage. Ignorance is not the same as, as deception. Deception is that you think you know. Ignorance is that you just don't know. Ignorance, ignorance, scripture says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. It didn't say that my people mess up a little bit for lack of knowledge. It don't say my people are set back for lack of knowledge. It don't say that my people have a good hard 10 years or half of life for lack of knowledge. It says my people are destroyed. That is destroyed. That's destruction. Destruction has an owner or one who wants, who wants to engineer you for that for a purpose, and that's the thief, right? The thief comes to kill, steal, and, de and destroy. That tells you then that ignorance is a weapon of the thief. The thief want to come in your house when you don't know he in your house. The thief want to pick your pocket when you don't know he been in your pocket. The thief wants to get something from you that you don't know is gone till he gone. Ignorance is a weapon of the thief. I told the staff this yesterday. I worked it in here. I told you I wanted to talk about it a little bit. I told the staff this yesterday. The Bible says when a thief is found out, he's got to return it seven times. We love that scripture. Seven times. God, bring it back seven times. I declare seven times anointing. I declare everything that's been, right? But it don't say when a declaration is made, it's brought back seven times. That's why I don't always pray it in every prayer. 
It says when a thief is found out, he must return it seven times. Your declaration without finding out the thief is, is similar to the mother who gets on television and calls to the thief to have compassion on her child. And say, if you're out there and you have my child, please bring them home. That means that the abductor has not been found out and you are trying to plead for something to come back to you that you have no access to get to. So your declarations don't bring it back seven times unless it's connected to the discovery of the thief. The thief is not identified in this scripture by somebody that you are hot on his heels. It's not somebody, it's not something that you just beating up on and you got him on the ropes. You're like, yeah, give me my seven times back. No, it's not the thing that you know about. That's why it says if a thief is found out. That implies that you don't know he's there. This is something that operates in and around you in your thinking, in your home, in your generations, all around. And you think it's okay. You don't think it's a problem or you don't see it at all. So when you finally recognize it, that's one translation is when the thief is recognized or when the thief is discovered. Because it's not the thing you know about that's killing you. It's the thing you don't know. Hollywood has declared it uh, and just tell all their business in their little occult realm self. They say that the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Because the one you don't know is killing you. So, so it says when a thief is found out. So it tells you then that something is operating in stealth. Something that you don't know that is robbing you. Something that is picking your pocket. Something that, that you wonder why you take two steps forward and four steps back and you can't figure it out. How come there's never any progression? And you start working on this and praying that, but that didn't change it. And you work on this and it didn't change it. And here's how it deceives you long term. You come talk to the pastor. The pastor say, hey, you need to do this, do this, do that. I already done everything. No, you are deceived. You ain't done nothing. That's the problem. <laughs> and when a thief is found out, you have to discover that thief because ignorance is a tool of the thief and destruction comes behind it. It says that my people are destroyed because of a lack of knowledge. Watch this, though, because they reject knowledge. Not because knowledge is lacking. They don't lack knowledge because knowledge is lacking. They lack knowledge because they reject it. That means that the knowledge is readily available and in front of you, and you decide that it's not true, maybe because you're deceived. So deception keeps you ignorant. There's two things that cause a person to reject knowledge. One is that there is a spiritual influence that pushes you to reject knowledge, right? Um, those spiritual influence could be one like a spirit of perversion, something that perverts the truth as you hear it, right? So that you hear it skewed. So that you hear when someone says we're against police brutality, you hear we're against the police. When you hear Black Lives Matter, you hear uh, uh, no one else matters. That's a perversion of the truth, right? Likewise, a perversion of the truth is that just because somebody died in an interaction between police and, 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 and a minority, that that cop was racist. That's a perversion of the truth. Maybe somebody reached for something. Oh, y'all thought everybody was innocent? No, cops pull criminals over too. You know, there's a mixed bag here. And, and, and unless you change your filter, you're going to think every situation is the same situation. Let me tell you that there is a difference from Tamir Rice to, to uh, uh, Rashad, whatever his name is, in Atlanta. And you know I don't know his name because he's wrong. Yeah, I said it. I don't care what you hashtagging. Everybody ain't, ain't, ain't a good example. Everybody ain't a catalyst for change. Some things y'all hashtag and set the movement back. Yeah. And that's probably because Black Lives Matter organization is a bunch of witches who really, who really have no idea or desire for progression, but really have a desire for captivity so long as they have captured, captured, 
captivated your mind, captivated the agenda, captivated the media, captivated your dollar and your allegiance. They don't have to make any changes. They can just keep you running in circles. This is, this is what happens when someone rebels against God is they don't take the promise, they circle the mountain. And that's all that BLM has been doing because they are witches. You got to put the right filter on. Um, there's perversion. There's a spirit of error that, that has you mix up everything that you see or read. It, spirit of error messes up the way that you read scripture. Um, and I'm not making this stuff up. You can look up the spirit of error in the Bible. <laughs> that it, 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 it makes you misinterpret scripture. Which is why folks don't have no power when they deal with the enemy. It's because you are appropriating verses to a devil that, they, that don't even apply. What are you talking about? The devil's sitting there like, yeah, Jesus I know. <laughs> Paul I know. But you don't even know your Bible. Pride. Pride causes you a spirit of pride. Now, there is the, the, the nature of man that is prideful that works hand in hand with this thing. Um, but the spirit of pride causes you to, to reject everything. That spirit causes you to think, I can be like. That's what the enemy said. I can be like. I can be, I can be the one who gives the answers. I don't need, you can't counsel me. Because if you're like the most high, who can counsel him? Who does he go to for help? If he was hungry, he wouldn't tell you. This is what a spirit of pride does to people. Who can counsel you? Who can tell you anything? When you're struggling, you don't tell nobody because you got to let everybody think you got it all together. Because you can be like. Uh, the spirit of pride comes on and says, I, I, it's generated generationally. It comes down from right, Eve on down. Down to, to Cain, and, and Cain says, I can give God what I want to give him. It don't matter what you say. The truth is, what I'm giving out is what I want to give out, and that's okay. That causes you to reject truth. Uh, a deaf and dumb spirit causes you to reject truth. A deaf and dumb spirit, this is one of those spirits that, that, that it affects your hearing, it affects your speech, it affects your mental ability. Um, Things that fall under a spirit that is deaf and dumb are things like autism. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. right. Stuff like that. Yeah. Um, other mental oppressions in that area, we like to give it names and say it's on the spectrum. But the, anything that stops you from being able to speak Amen. or hear properly falls under this realm. So, so... What happens is there's a boy, and I believe this boy is mute, the Bible says, in Mark chapter 9. And when he's brought to the church, nothing can be done with him. You want to know what I think? Now, I don't know. This is me talking freely. That they brought that boy to church, and the church was more interested in what the psychologist said than what the scripture said. And was scared to deal with them in deliverance in the complete manner because they had to tippy toe between deliverance and casting out demons and not offending the therapist or the parent or the prescription because somebody said this is normal and you can manage it and it's called this and the moment you have a diagnosis in this realm it's hard to get deliverance in that realm because now the, the one who is offering deliverance has to battle past your faith and your prescription. Has to battle past your faith in technology, your faith in a diagnosis. And so long as you believe in that white coat more than you believe in God's word, then you are stuck as the gatekeeper. I can't offer your children nothing that you won't accept. And as the gatekeeper of yourself, if there's no repentance and acceptance, then I can't fight you and fight the devil. So... I believe they brought them and they couldn't get nothing done because the church is too scared just because they, you know, they name everything now just so you can't pray against it. Oppositional defiance disorder. All that means is they need a whooping. That's all it means. They need a whooping. Then they won't defy any opposition again. 
It'll be, it won't be, it, it'll be in order. It won't be a disorder. This is, but, but once they name it and they'll give you SSI for it, you won't even ask God for freedom from it because you can't serve both God and money. Bondage. This is one of the spirits that causes you to reject knowledge. You reject the revelation because, because you enjoy the benefit. So you choose destruction with a paycheck. Deaf and dumb spirit causes you, you don't even want to hear it. That's why some people you talk to, they can't hear. That's why Jesus said, he who got an a ear to hear, let him hear it. This is why the Bible says, be quick to listen and slow to speak. This is why the Bible says, give me the ear of the learned and the tongue of the learned. This is why the Bible says, incline your ear unto me. It's, so, so there's so much to hearing that if the enemy can cause you to be deaf to the things of God. Bondage. Uh, a spirit of lies. Uh, causes you to reject truth or reject uh, revelation, and that's easy. It's just because you've been lied to and you believe a lie, right? We ain't got to walk into all that. Um, that's the spiritual side of uh, what causes you to reject knowledge. The other thing that causes you to reject knowledge actually is one of the weapons, and it works right in this, and this is all inside of you, is strongholds. When we think of strongholds, we always think of blaming demons, don't we? Y'all do know that strongholds are not demons. Strongholds are places where demons can find refuge. But they are not created by the demon and they are not demons. Strongholds are, are things you create in your mind. Right. This is why the Bible says cast down every evil imagination. It tells us it tells us to, to tear down every stronghold and it's dealing in the times where we have to call every thought into order. Right. Strongholds happen in the mind. These are thought processes that we're conditioned to and we reinforce in our mind and we build up a stronghold to defend that thought process. So if I believe that you are racist then I have to reinforce that thought pattern in order to, to have it fortified so that you can't break through it. So now I'm going to think of every personal offense that I've ever had, whether it's little or a lot, and make it big and strong. And then I'm going to take the president out of context and wipe that on top of it. And then I'm going to listen to everything the news says about policing or about this or about that. And I'm not just going to take the truth out of it. I'm going to take the truth and the lie because it makes the reinforcement better. I'm going to lean into the algorithm and find things that only go with my thought process and now there's nothing you can tell me because I have a stronghold in regards to race. And the problem is now here comes an unclean spirit and says oh I'm good. Now you can't even get free. Now that spirit causes you to hate people. That spirit causes you to be a victim. This is where oppression and bondage comes in because now you no longer operate in the victory of God because that spirit is in that stronghold that you have given it, convincing you that you have been run over by a system. Now, I don't, I don't uh, uh, pretend to think systemic oppression isn't real. It is real. Here's, here's the thing is that my God is in a different kingdom. And I'm in this world, but not of this world. And you may think you can keep me out of something, but the spirit of the living God says that every door that he wants me to walk through, I'm going to walk through because he opens a great effectual door. And God opens a door that no man can shut and closes doors that no man can open. So so while you may have a system, my God walked on your system, period. So, 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 but, but when, I, when I build that stronghold, that thing oppresses me because I have to sacrifice my victory to be the victim. I have to sacrifice my truth and God and freedom in order to play the slave and play the beaten. Uh, this is, this is, some folks is mad at me right now. It's all right. I don't, want, I don't want to get hung up on that because y'all be trying to go home at 9, 10. So. <laughs> but it's, a stronghold is reinforced, a reinforced thought pattern and conditioning that you have accepted as true that demonic influence then hides in. And, and, and it's called uh, dysfunction. So now no one can tell you, hey, that's unclean because it's just the way you think. 
and it's given to you by, it could be given to you by your parents, it could be given to you by, by your, your, your school system, the teachers all teach one thing all the way through college, keeping the kids out of it, and they build strongholds in your ideas. Someone could just call you ugly your whole life, and then you have this insecurity that begins, and now you can't believe that anyone would think that you're pretty, no matter how pretty you are. You, you, you have this thing about you that keeps you feeling like no matter what you do, it's never good enough, but the God I serve said you were good enough the day he sent you here that there's nothing you could do you're the apple of his eye but when somebody then convinced you that you wasn't good enough you will work your whole life just trying to be average just to fit in with something that ain't you it's the stronghold it's the stronghold that comes in the stronghold of poverty that comes in and then and has you spend your money foolishly and you just think you better spend it when you get it this that and the other and then what happens is the spirit of lack moves into that stronghold and steals it like like a, you putting your money in a bag with holes in it this is what happens is it works hand in hand uh it's, it's a welcome home party to the enemy Reinforced thoughts, and it comes from being deceived, right? Uh, you stare at that same picture long enough, and you start building something, and it becomes generational and familiar spirits. There's a reason, and, and you can't tell nobody that they wrong because mama did it like this. Yeah. Grandmama did it like this. It's got to be right, right? Um, there you go. And then when you, uh, <laughs> if you're watching online, that was Ariel. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's Jonah. It's Jonah. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was Pastor Ariel's son Jonah's phone. <laughs> See, we can't get we can't get caught up in the stronghold of what you was yesterday as who you always gonna be. No, when God shifts the thing, that'll preach. That'll preach right there. <laughs> You know, when you hear something long enough, you start to believe it. This is how strongholds are built. When you stare at something long enough, you start to believe it. You receive it. When you, when, you, when you hear it, you start believing it. This is the danger in the media. The media will create strongholds in your thinking that you never had before. The media, and I say this, they operate on hypnosis. Um, you've heard me use this term online, or maybe in preaching ventriloquism, uh, which is a tactic used by the witches or the high priest of, of Delphi, uh, excuse me, the high priestess of Pythia in Delphi, which was the oracle of Delphi, and the, in the temple of Apollos, who used ventriloquism as an incantation and an illusion. Casting their voice into the mouth of other people, creating false witnesses. This is what happens. We use the term modern day talking points. Can't nobody tell me why they don't like this party without using the given talking points. Um, because if you hear it long enough, it gets into you. If you hear it long enough, it gets into you. Your parents say the same thing over and over. you just like your mother. You're just like your father. Man, you're stubborn. Man, if you just do what I told you to do. You're so, you're so disobedient. You're so rebellious. You're so rebellious. You're so, well, don't get mad when they turn out to be a witch. Um, culture, culture, always saying the same thing, setting the same tone, setting what is acceptable, setting how you dress, how you walk, what time you, and we conform to culture more than we try to set culture. Music, music playing over and over on repeat. When we get mad, we put certain songs on. When we get sad, we put certain songs on. When we get, when, when we with our lady, we put certain songs on. When we by ourselves, we put certain songs on. You know what I'm saying? I got, I got a couple playlists. Boy, when I'm by myself, it's Thug Nation in the car. <laughs> Guns is popping. You know? <laughs> Corners is full. You know? <laughs> when she get in the car, she be like, we got to be hard all the time. Love gets made all in the radio. <laughs> No, but we put music on that we like, oh, and it plays it over and over. So once you get into a depression, you can't get out of that depression because you reinforce it in the stronghold. Uh, this is why God says uh, in, through scripture to put on a garment of praise. Don't put on your saddest song. Put on a garment of praise for a spirit of heaviness because if you put on heaviness, you're going to reinforce the stronghold. And then the spirit there is, is, is stuck in there. We listen to it and we sing it over and over ourselves. Listen, y'all might think, Cardi B is cool, but let your daughter sing them songs long enough. Don't be mad when she's skipping class, trying to slide out. 
Your meditation, your meditation. This is why Paul says think on these things, and he gives a list of these things, because what you let go and circle your mind. And you guys know how it works in the mind. You'll get something on your head. Somebody will do something, and you'll be like, what did they do that for? I wonder what they meant by that. Oh, yeah, they didn't, they didn't got their claws in you spiritually, spiritually. They, they hit you with something, they say something slicky, and it sounds supportive, but you ain't so sure, you'll be like, huh? I wonder what they meant by that. And then for the next day and a half, it's, you meditate on it day and night. Before you know it, you didn't left the church, or you didn't, you didn't ready to pull up on them. I, I, I swear I'm going, but if they say something sideways, I'm in they mouth. I'm in they mouth. I'm about to make his dentist retire. And they didn't even mean nothing by it. You just, you just made a stronghold. Strongholds. Strongholds, deception, ignorance. These are weapons of the enemy, right, um, of bondage. I don't know how many minutes I got yet but left, but I'm just going to do it, right, because I'm going to finish this message. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. <laughs> Check this out. I know a dude who had a bunch of money. I can't tell you. He had a bunch of money stolen from him off his cash app, right? And, and what y'all on about? Y'all don't even know if he deserved it or not. <laughs> I know a dude had a little bit of his money, his money taken from him off cash app, right? And, and cash app is one of those things that, that you really don't have no backing for. It's like they, they don't got no customer service. They don't care, you know? They're like, they're like yeah, they got you, dang. <laughs> That's Cash App's response. Dang. <laughs> Let me know how it work out. <laughs> Cash App wants you to update them. <laughs> it's only funny because it's true and all y'all know it. <laughs> they won't even help you if a website fraudulently hits your account. You'll be like, I don't even know this website. For real? <laughs> Let us know how that work out. <laughs> Anyway, this dude had this happen, and, and, and so in, in his investigation, he calls Cash App, and Cash App tells him, there's nothing we can really do for you as far as reimbursing you because the item that the money was taken from uh, had this account on it before, that device had this account on it before, or was used on the account before, which um, that's why you don't let folks all up in your stuff. So, so, so all that said to say is that the thief wants to gain through deceitful means, a legal right to what belongs to you. Wow. This is a manifestation of the spirit of the thief, is that he wants to gain through any means, through illegal means, legal right to what belongs to you. See, in this particular story, a thief had legal right to the money because of one small interaction some time ago. This is, this is how bondage works. This is why we have to be careful because we enter into bondage through legal contracts a lot of times. Slavery was an economic system. It, it were legal transactions that made people in bondage. So when you start dealing with bondage, you really start dealing with deceitful means that gain legal rights. This is, this is why we get the, the great accuser of the brethren. See, the enemy understands how God's courts work, how he's a judge. So he's an accuser, and he wants to gain legal rights. So he's always pleading his case. Where you been? Walking to and fro, seeking who I may devour. Well, did you try Job? Job's got a hedge around him, and he only prays. And he's always making a case. He's always making a case. And so this is how the enemy works. He works through legalities. The enemy, don't, he can't work against you through any other means. This is what you have to understand. The enemy don't come wildly against Christians flailing his arms because he's going to run smack dab into the word. So the only way then that he can try to manipulate you is by coming through the legal means of the word that you don't understand. Eve, did God say you couldn't have none of these trees? No, that's not what he said. He said, I can have this net. Well, that's not true. Okay. This is what happens. Tells Jesus, throw yourself down because his word says that he would give his angels charge over you lest you dash your foot against the stone. He, he tries to come through the word because he tries to come through legal means and establish dominion. Uh, it's fraud. 
is identity theft. This is what he wants. He wants to take your identity for himself. It is, it is robbery. Robber, I mean, the thing about robbery it, that, that, that wants legal means to the money, if I rob you, if I put a gun in your face and take the money out your wallet, put it in my wallet, walk away, take my mask off because I left the store and I don't have to wear one out the store. <laughs> oh, y'all thought it was a robbery mask. No, it was a COVID mask. <laughs> I took my mask off, <laughs> drove to the next store, <laughs> went in the store, put a soda on the counter, opened it up and took the dollar out of my wallet that I took out your wallet, put it on the thing, and they're going to take it as a fair exchange and a legal transaction. Even robbery seeks to take your stuff and gain legal ownership of it because of nine tenths of the law. Ownership is nine tenths of the law. Um, the enemy uh, is in the scam and fraud business. Uh, some of the contracts that we enter into in the spirit, we forget the old saying that the devil is in the details, right? Y'all know the enemy needs an access point, though. This is where the contracts are created because the enemy needs an access point. This is what he tells God about Job. God, I need an access point. There's no way for me to get to him. I can't get to him. I can't just blow through that word that you got around him. I can't just kick through that worship that he's offering up to you. I can't just get to his house where he's covered in prayer. The blood of Jesus is all around him. Angels can't round about him. What you want me to do? I ain't got no access to him. God says, okay, I'll take that off. I'll give you a little access. But sometimes we give the access. We ain't surrounded like Job is surrounded. Um, so here's, here's some of the places we give access to and open up legal contracts. You ready? Sunset. The sunset. The Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your anger or you give the devil a foothold. The, the moment you was mad past the night, Baby, I forgive you. I know you was mad at me. I was praying the whole time interceding for you. I said, look, I said, she ain't the gatekeeper, devil. I said, I'm the head of this house. She can be mad all she want. <laughs> I'm just playing, baby. <laughs> I ain't playing with the devil, though. I was true about all that. It, was, it ain't jokes. But, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but it say don't let the sun go down on your anger. The moment that you go to bed angry, you have just given the enemy legal Access. We, we don't think of it like that. We think, we think it's all right. I'm, I'm, he, I'll get him in the morning. That's fine. Get him in the morning. Don't forget that 3 a.m. is the witching hour. Don't forget that, they, that they, they, they love the hour of 3 to 3.30 because they believe that's when Jesus died on the cross. That's why Jesus walks up to them when they're on the boat in the fourth watch which is about 3 a.m. and they looked out and thought it was a spirit walking on the water because this was the witching hour this and, and this was in the marine world when he walks out on there and that's why he said is that a spirit and Jesus had to tell them don't be afraid it's me I know you ain't used to me walking at this hour because you're sleeping but you probably went to bed angry that's why you're nervous right now there's uh here, here, here's one here's one Married folks, abstinence. The Bible say, wives, don't deprive your husbands. Husbands, don't deprive your wives, except for a short time, the mutual consent to devote yourself to prayer. But after that, come back together again so that the devil don't tempt you from your own lack of self-control. The moment you decide to abstain for an argument, devil legal access. The moment you decide that you just don't feel like it, legal access, headache. Legal access. How, how did devil come in through the Tylenol bottle? Legal access. Le <laughs> Tired, legal access. This is what happens. If it ain't for prayer, if it ain't for prayer and mutual consent, which means this, if you praying and he want it, put your Bible down and go give it to him. Prayer, mutual consent. All my husbands should be amen in me right now. If you don't, it's because you either don't know the word of God, don't believe that it's all true, or you don't want to have sex with your wife. <laughs> Pastor Ariel said, or you ain't got that problem. Chadi, you ain't never had a headache? No, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. I mean, Pastor Chadi, she heals and she ain't got no headache. <laughs> I ain't, no, 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 we, we online, we online, sit down, sit down, pastor, sit down, we online. 
if y'all was in here, boy, we having a good time. <laughs> I, <laughs> Short time by mutual consent. Watch this. And not just because y'all agreed to not do it, but for this sole purpose, to devote yourself to prayer. Watch this. Short time, though. Y'all ain't fasting 40 days and 40 nights, and it's okay. It's a short time. You ain't getting no 21-day Daniel fast in and calling it holy. It's a short time. For a short time to devote yourself to prayer. Pray quick, because I'm ready. Pray quick, because it's now. The time is now. <laughs> a day is coming, and now is. <laughs> But it says that when you deprive for any other reasons, husbands or spouses, you give, you allow the enemy in. Um, you allow, you give the enemy access by folks that's close to you. That's why you can't be everybody's friend. Because folks that you in covenant with, you basically build a bridge between their mess and yours. The moment you enter into contract with them, you have built a bridge for their familiar spirits to come bother you. This is, it. This is uh, the, way, the way it is. You, you got to watch who you're walking with and who you're standing with and who you're sitting with. The Bible says, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly or stands in the way of the sinner or sits in the seat of the mocker. Now, let me help you church folks that think that mean non-church people. People who give ungodly advice go to church too. People with a spirit of error, a spirit of perversion that don't know the scripture that will advise you wrong and in error and push you towards your passions and your lusts instead of accountability to the word of God. That they'll tell you to do what you want to do rather than submit. That is witchcraft. And so what happens is you can have ungodly counsel in a godly place. If you don't think that's true, ask Eve how the serpent got there. You can't be standing with everybody and walking with everybody and sitting down with everybody. Um, 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, bad company corrupts good character. Watch this. That's half the verse. The whole verse actually sounds like this. Be not deceived. Bad company corrupts good character because deception is a weapon of bondage. And if you are deceived and get connected to bad company, then your character gets corrupted and you fall under the bondage of the corrupted character. This so, so, and it happens through deception. Um, behavior, your behavior, behavior is one of the things that gives the enemy a legal right. For instance, grudge holding. Grudge holding gives the devil legal rights to your life. Gives the spirit of bondage legal right because the way Jesus said it is if you don't forgive, my father won't forgive you. He says, he says, if you have an ought with a brother, hurry up and make it right so that your prayers might be heard. The moment you hold a grudge, you permit the enemy to block your prayers. You, you take a gamble. Your prayers become a lottery pick on whether they get heard or not because they might get heard or they might not, depending on how bad the grudge is. So go and make it right. Um, Jesus tells a story that there was one man who owed this much money and one who owed this much money, and the king forgave them both. And, and, and when they left, the one who, who, who owed... Uh, all his money went and found someone who owed him a little bit of money almost beat him to death and they came back and told the king y'all know this story and the king said uh how could you not forgive when i forgave you so much and he says put him into the prison where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth unforgiveness is, the, is an avenue towards bondage period this is something that gives legal access to the enemy to torment you legal access to the enemy to oppress you it's often said unforgiveness is the poison you drink hoping others will die from it that's unforgiveness rebellion rebellion i'm done going fast now because i got to get done but rebellion is one of those things that, that gives legal access. We all understand that, that the sin of rebellion is as witchcraft. The minute we enter into rebellion and pushing away from what God has set as an authority, we give the spirit of witchcraft legal access to our life. Uh, that's not some cute saying. Here's what else, here's, here's why you really give it the access, right? The minute you are unsubmitted, to a godly authority, and by godly authority, the Bible says every uh, authority that's been placed has been placed by God. They are God's ministers. So that puts it down to your teachers, to your pre preachers. It puts it to your, to your government, right? It get to, the, to, the, to the party that's in, in presidency that you like or don't like, whether it's this term or the next or the last. Agents of rebellion are, are, are covens. Um, 
So what happens is the minute you become unsubmitted to a godly authority, you become unsubmitted to God. Because that's God's minister. And they don't have to be righteous to be placed. God put Nebuchadnezzar in place and used him. God put Pharaoh in place and used him to bring Israel and his people together. You, 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 it don't have to be something you prefer for it to be something that God chose. And so, so the minute you become unsubmitted, here's what happens, though. The minute you become unsubmitted, no fleeing happens. What do I mean by that? The Bible says if you submit to Christ, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. The minute you take the submission away, you can resist all you want. He ain't going nowhere. He going to sit there and fight you and fight you and fight you. And the thing is this, uh, that weapon may not actually be allowed to prosper against you, but it's not commanded to relent. So while it may not knock you all the way down, it will contend with you over and over and over and over until you're too tired to fight. This is how you grow weary and well-doing. This is how you, this is how when men sleep, this is how men fall asleep. The Bible says that you'll reap if you faint not. This is how you faint. Doubt is a, is a, is, is a, gives legal access. Um, because the, what doubt does is it sacrifices your stability. Doubt sacrifices your stability, and it forfeits your right to answer prayers. Doubt forfeits your right to yes and amen. Why? Because the Bible says when you ask God, you should ask, believe it, and not doubt. For he who doubt is an unstable person, uh, double-minded, unstable in all their ways, and they shouldn't believe they'll receive anything from God. So the minute God is not answering your prayers, you are... Your speech, Manny, come on up here and play. Let's give him some hope. <laughs> How many of y'all want me to quit in the middle right here? Look, I don't know where I'm at. I mean, I don't think it's the middle, but you know what I'm talking about. In the middle of this list. Speech, speech, your speech gives the enemy legal access. You know why? Because those who love it going to eat its fruit. You have life or death. Those who love it eats its fruit. What comes out your mouth, you going to feast on. Complain if you want to. Talk about it if you want to. Criticize it if you want to. Insult it if you want to. Talk negative if you want to. Give bad forecasts if you want to. That's going to be the world you walk in. You give the enemy legal access. Unconfessed sin gives the enemy legal access. Ungodly soul ties gives the enemy legal access. Cursed objects in your home gives the enemy legal access. Cursed objects are like, they're not party favors. You shouldn't come home from that party with a deck of tarot cards. You shouldn't come home with something that you think is cute, like a, a dream catcher necklace, or, or this thing is fancy, I like it on my clothes, or, or it's not a family heirloom. Grandma left this for me. Was grandma saved? Or was grandma a bruja? That ring is a family heirloom because you come from heirloom because you come from a family of witches. You can miss your grandmother and get rid of the accursed thing. There are accursed objects that we bring into our home that we don't even understand. You buy them on vacation, on beaches, in places, and people walk through selling stuff. You don't know who made it, who prayed for it, who did what. You bought it, thought you was helping the economy, but never anointed and said, I break every attachment to this seashell necklace. I break every attachment to this little doll or whatever. You just bring it home, pack it up, give it to your children. Here, here's a memento, something to remember us by spoken curses spoken curses are a crazy thing because guess who speaks them you do the devil can't curse you the devil can't curse what God has blessed no witch can say anything over a believer that has any power they can throw their chicken bones throw their white dust put their dead animals down you, you could have saved that budget bro you could have ate that chicken and put that salt somewhere else I, I don't you didn't waste your gas driving over here thought you was doing that's stupid man here go 10 tip that cat call him a lift he can't curse you. They can't curse you. But what you can do is curse yourself. Saying things like, I'll never win. I can't do it. 
is always going to be the same. It's never going to change. It's always been like this. Long as I can remember, I struggle with this. I battle with this. Mama was like this. And we say this kind of stuff. Oh, I don't know if that's going to work. Oh, I really don't know how tomorrow is going to turn out. And we say this stuff over ourselves. We get songs that sing lyrics over ourselves. Uh, uh, wives become whores and husbands become become whoremongers. And, 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 and you wonder why the nation has changed and why someone raised up under the word of God leaves the house of God looking like they don't know God. It's because they heard the preacher on Sunday and the preacher on Wednesday, but on Monday they was quoting a favorite rapper 24-7. They favorite songstress 24-7. Yeah, her music good, but she she's an actual witch. Yeah, her music good, but she put her kids to bed with crystals on their belly. What, what are we talking about? Do you hear the lyrics you're singing over yourself over and over and over and over and reprogramming your destiny over and over from day in day out like Goliath coming in soothsaying the same song I think it was Tupac said all around the world same song over and over generational curses give legal contract because someone else signed up for it it's like your mother putting her water in your name Someone else signed up for the debt that you got going on um, because the sins of the father are visited on the sons for three and four generations. You know, Lot offered his daughters to be raped. This is how stuff is passed down. Uh, I mean, that is a flagrant, outright imagery of it. But this is what parents do to their children. He thought he was doing it for the church. For the church, people have sacrificed their children. That they have not spent time with their children in the name of looking good for the church or doing God's thing while never, ever really doing God's thing and killing your children. Uh, uh, you can't help your kids do this because you got to go to church. But you ain't faithful to the church. That's why pastor ain't used you for nothing running in circles see lot offered his daughters to be raped to save the angels when they left and they got to the mountain generational curse his daughters raped him and created an entire people based on incest unholy vows I ain't gonna finish this today, y'all. I'm just gonna quit after this point. Ain't no way I could finish this. And I see some of y'all dozing off, so it ain't like normally, y'all normally excited. I'm just playing, I'm just playing. I just have a lot left. Um, unholy vows gives access legally to the enemy. What's an unholy vow? This is what the Bible says. It says, above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven or by earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea and your nay be nay, lest ye fall into condemnation. Here's a, here's a, here's a prime saying of today. You ready? On God. Bet I do. On God. That's this generation's way of saying, I swear to God, I'm telling you the truth about this thing. I swear to God, I'll go do that thing. I swear to God, oh my mama. Nothing in heaven or on earth, the Bible says. Oh my mama, oh my kids, oh my kids, oh my dead homies. Shut up. They ain't even like you. Y'all ain't become friends after they died and you could put it on Facebook. Got one picture from the third grade. You asked for that one too. Yo, take a picture with me. Now y'all homeboys. We swear on everything. So I tell my kids, no promises. They say, Dad, can we just, no promises, I'll let you know. I let my yes be yes and my no be no. It says, it says that if you swear on anything else other than yes being yes and no being no, that you fall into condemnation. What do you think you fall into when you say something and then say on God and you was wrong because you was deceived? What do you do when you, when you threaten somebody, I'll do this on God, but God know your heart and you soft as cookie dough. And you really just hoping that that saying intimidates them, but really on God, you wouldn't do it, but you put it on God and now you're going to be hung by them words. 
because you have given the enemy legal contract. Little sayings like, this is my best friend forever. Unholy vows. Some of y'all put best friend forever with people y'all don't talk to no more. But that little three letters gave their familiar spirits bridges into your marriage. Bridges into your well-being. A BFF you ain't seen in 20 years, but you made a vow with. Bible says this, and I'll end with this because I got a lot going on here. I was going to tell you how to beat all of that. I was going to teach you how to beat all of that. I was going to teach you how to cast the devil out. I was going to tell you uh, how to deal with the strong man, but we have to do that another time. Y'all ain't got it in you. I promise you, y'all ain't got the endurance I got. Uh, I can sit here for another hour. Anyway, let me, just, let me just end with this. Where was I at? I was up here talking junk. Ha. Huh. All right, here we go. Here we go. Bible say this. Give no room to the devil. All of these vows, all of these uh, actions that we can do that give the enemy legal access, the Bible warns us, give no room to the devil. Give no room to him. Which means all of these things that have given legal access per scripture, we're not supposed to do them and give any room. When it says give no room, the implication is make no residence for. Don't let him move in. Don't make room for him. If your life is crowded with the things of God, don't move them out of the way to make space for him to be there. Uh, don't make no empty space for him because when he come back and he find it empty, he's going to bring seven brothers. Now that little bit of room you made became a lot of room. And in order to make that much room, you got to throw some God things away so that you can fit some enemy things in and he has legal right to it because you made room for it. When the Bible tells us, your gift makes room for you. Scripture says your gift makes room for you. That tells me then if we are giving room to the devil, that my room giving is, is attached to gift giving. If, if, if my gift makes room for me, room giving is attached to gift giving. So if I make room, for instance, the one woman said, I perceive this is a man of God. I want to make a room for him. And she put a bed in there and a table. That she, it was a gift. Her room giving was attached to gift giving. That tells me then that if you make room from, for the devil, then that implies you have accepted a gift or a payment from him. So this is how the legalities work is because you have accepted a benefit of the sin as payment for the, for, for the presence. You have accepted a benefit of that, of that sinfulness as a benefit for his residing. This is how bondage begins. And I'll finish this another time, maybe next week, because I got too many more pages there tomorrow next time we'll talk about breaking all of this stuff you know what i mean how to break through and free from every contract every legality talk about the the ultimate final blow of bondage which is not these subtle ones but the outright warfare with the strong man we're gonna deal with all of that and uh y'all make sure y'all come ready to fight all right father god we thank you for who you are father right now in the name of jesus i bind the hand of the enemy I bind the hand of the enemy. I bind every work of bondage in the mighty name of Jesus. I command it to be muted and still and powerless until, God, the finishing of this word in Jesus' name, that your children could hear the full revelation, seek the full freedom, God, and that they could evacuate these things from their life in Jesus' mighty name. And I declare between now and them that they are held safe in your hand, provided for by your spirit, protected by your blood, standing on your word in Jesus' mighty name. Mighty name. Amen. Come on, Pastor. Amen. Amen. I love when you give an amazing word like that, Pastor. Thank you. Now it's time for us to have the opportunity to give. And I believe that it's important for us to always remember that, like I said last week, if you were here, that when you do something with your seed that goes above and beyond what you have already planned in your heart and in your mind, God can bless that beyond what you can imagine and think, right? Don't give a stronghold and a bondage to, I need to hold on to my money right now. When you do that, God can't release a blessing over you because you won't release what's his already. So 
put that in your heart. Put that in your mind. Consider right now, what should I give cheerfully and not holding it back, thinking I need to eat this tomorrow when God's about to pour out on you a blessing. Amen? So you can give three different ways. We have an envelope if you need one. If you want to give in person, you can give through the app. You can also give in Cash App. Make sure you're giving through however you have an opportunity to give. Let's bless that right now. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you and I praise you for this awesome day that you've blessed us, Lord. For every giver that's here today, I pray that you would bless them, Lord, that you would bless their seed, that you would bless their heart, what they've already prepared to give, Lord, and what they're about to give beyond that, Lord. That you would use it to multiply for your kingdom, to reach the lost, Lord Jesus, to bring about a fullness of blessing into their lives. I pray that you would bless them right now. Lord, I also pray that you would bless the giver that wants to give but doesn't have the ability, Lord. But if they had it, they would give it to you freely because their heart is right. Lord, I pray that you would bless them with an abundance that they could give back to you so it will come back pressed down, shaken together, and running over in their lives, Lord. That you would give in so they could be a blessing to others. And we just thank you for the blessing you're giving to us now. In your mighty name we pray that. Amen. 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 Wait.